As Pastor Andy mentioned, we are beginning a new sermon series, um, four-week series that is entitled Reset. God's mercies are new every morning. Amen? Amen. But sometimes it's easy for us to get stuck in the same old routine. This new year, let's hit the reset button so we can claim the fresh start that God makes available to us. And as we rediscover our true identity in the love of God, we will discover new purpose and guided, be guided by the compass of God's values, we'll head off in an exciting, God-given direction. So here's what we are going to be addressing in the next few weeks. Today is week one, soul reset. Resetting your soul begins with remembering who you are. In baptism, God calls us beloved. Week two is reset purpose. Spending time with God enables us to start our year with intention. Centered living comes from understanding God's purpose in this season. And next Sunday, Pastor Andy will help us think seriously about our purpose. Week three, reset values. What does it mean to live by God's spirit and not our own? To live according to God's values and not those of the world? And week four, reset direction. Whether we've been in the church for a long time or just beginning to explore what faith really is, Jesus sometimes calls us to move in a new direction, even when we think we're already headed in the right direction. Today, our focus is looking at resettling your soul and how it begins with remembering who you are in baptism. God calls us beloved. You have been given a small mirror. If you came in and didn't get one, please go back on the usher's table or raise your hand and the usher will bring one to you. You have a little mirror and uh, you had the option of picking whatever saying you wanted. Hopefully you got one that's meaningful to you. And I want you to take a really good look at yourself in that mirror. Really look at yourself. What do you see? When you look at it, a mirror at home or somewhere else, what are your thoughts? You know, do you enjoy what you see? Do you wish you had long hair or different features? Do you wish you weighed more or less? Do you feel good about how you look? I want you to keep that mirror handy because we're going to be thinking about it throughout the service. And even though I ask these questions, what I really want you to do this morning is to think about how you feel about who you are, not just what you look like. How would you describe yourself? You know, if someone said to you, tell me about yourself, what would you say? Would you answer something like this? Well, I'm married, I have two children and four grandchildren and I'm retired. Or maybe I'm um, single and I live in Hatboro, love to play golf and I'm employed at the clubhouse. So often we identify ourselves by telling others about our family status and our employment or where we live. Some people look at themselves and they're proud of who they are and others look at themselves and only think about their shortcomings, at least what they perceive to be shortcomings. Is that really all you want people to know about you? Have you ever actually told someone that you're a Christian? Did you hear what the scripture said about you this morning? Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ. I want you to look in the mirror again, and I want us all to say, I'm a child of God. 
look at the mirror and let's say that together. I am a child of God. How awesome is that? Have you ever told someone that? Have you ever said, I'm a child of God and so are you? When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. Other translations say, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. You know, at that time, people saw Jesus as Joseph's son. And of course we know now that Jesus is the son of God. But people then, in those days, knew him as Joseph's son. But we know that Jesus was always God's son. And when the dove descended upon Jesus, the others knew that as well. Just as Jesus calls us beloved, that's the way he sees us. God's love does not need to be earned. Belonging to God is an expression of God's freely given love and grace. Being beloved by God is agape love, which is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love. Agape love perfectly describes the kind of love Jesus Christ has for his our Father and his followers. That's the special love that God has for us, his beloved. It's immeasurable, incomparable, ongoing, self-sacrificing concern. This love God gives us without condition and extends beyond emotions. It demonstrates love through actions. In the message translation of the Bible, Eugene Peterson wrote today's Luke passage this way. After all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized. As he was praying, the sky opened up and the Holy Spirit, like a dove descending, came down upon him. And along with the Spirit, a voice, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. God feels that way about us too. He created us and designed us just the way he wanted us to be. We are the pride of his life. No one loves you or cares more about you than God does. How important it is for us to show our deepest love for him as well. Baptism is sacred, of course, but I thought you might enjoy this humor, humorous story told by Charles Swindoll in his book, The Grace Awakening. The minister of a church of a different denomination contacted the pastor of a huge downtown Baptist church and made an unusual request. He had several folks who recently had joined his church and they wanted to be baptized by immersion rather than by sprinkling, um, which was the church's normal mode of baptism. Well, the minister requested not only the use of the baptistry, but that the Baptist pastor himself baptized those who came. So this posed a dilemma. What if those being baptized weren't born again? Since it was the pastor's conviction that only Christians should be baptized, he realized he couldn't in good conscience cooperate with the plan but he wished to answer with tact and so as not to offend the other minister. I understand that he wrote a letter, a masterpiece of grace in which he included this humorous statement. We take in laundry. I'm sorry, we don't take in laundry, but we'll be happy to loan you our tub. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was baptized? Why was, why was it necessary for Jesus to be baptized? 
Well, verse 21 says, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. He did this to identify with us. By faith, we identify with him. Jesus was baptized at the river in solidarity with us humans. Luke emphasizes Jesus' human nature. He grew up with humble parents. His baptism was the first public declaration of his ministry. Last week, Pastor Andy shared about how baptism is an extension of epiphany as well, when we truly see who Jesus is. So instead of going to the established religious leaders, Jesus went to the river and identified with Christians who were repenting of their sin. The incident, I'm sorry, the ancient Christian writers had a saying, he, Jesus, became like us so that we might become like him. In baptism, the one human being who is also fully divine stands where we stand in submission to God. In baptism, the blessing is poured out on him. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. In baptism, we encounter God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the blessing is ascending. Jesus is about to do God's mission in the world. I was dedicated to God when I was a baby. And then when I was nine years old, I accepted Christ as my savior. I remember wearing a white gown, which um, took place in a pool behind the altar of the church. And the pastor held me and put me under the water three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I've always remembered my baptism. I cried and cried, and to this day, I cry every time I feel especially close to God. I had become a child of God, and I have served him with my heart all my life. Once we're baptized, then what? How does our soul begin to grow in Christ's likeness? It's reported that the Christian theologian and philosopher Dallas Willard is often asked by students why he, as a philosophy professor, is a follower of Christ. Dr. Willard reported to answer with this response. Can you think of anyone better to follow? All those who were baptized by John were told to follow Jesus. Our focus this morning is on who you are and whose you are. But we also ought to think about who John the Baptist was. John was a pointer. He did not accept any glory for himself but rather he pointed others to Christ. He told the crowds he was not the one to follow. Jesus is. John did not take on any glory for himself. I like what Gordon MacDonald wrote about John in his book, Ordering Your Private World. He wrote, John the baptizer is a powerful example of a called man. John seems to have had from the very beginning a vivid sense of destiny, the results of a heavenly assignment that came from deep inside him. To those who question him regarding his feelings about the growing popularity of the man from Nazareth, he likened his purpose to that of the best man at a wedding. John 3.29 says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend John, of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So the purpose of the best man is simply to stand with the groom, to make sure that all attention is riveted upon him. How many of you have ever been a best man at a wedding? 
Yeah, several of you. Well, don't you think that the best man would be a fool if in the middle of the wedding processional, he suddenly turned to the wedding guests and began to sing a song or engage in a humorous monologue? The best man has fulfilled his purpose most admirably when he draws no attention to himself but focuses all attention upon the bride and the groom. And that is what John did. If Jesus Christ was the groom, to use John's metaphor, then the baptizer was committed to being the best man and nothing else. That was the purpose that flowed from his call and he had no desire to aspire to anything beyond. Thus, to see the crowd headed toward Christ was the affirmation John needed. His purpose had been fulfilled. And that's something that we should be doing as well. When we think about resetting our souls, one of the important things we should do is to be like John and point people to Jesus Christ. Who are the people that God is placing on your heart to pray for, to witness to, and to help? Perhaps first, you need to make sure that you're praying for yourself and helping yourself to be the best version of you that you can be. When you're hurting, depressed, broken, or troubled in any way, remember that you have a Savior who understands your humanity. When you sin, remember that he has paid the price for your disobedience. Remember, you are God's beloved. As you think about who you are, remember that we need to resist the temptation to jump ahead into any plans that we may be contemplating before receiving the Holy Spirit's direction. And it's also good to keep in mind that Jesus waited 30 years before he could begin his ministry. So if you are not yet all you want to be or want to do, wait patiently for God's timing. It's always perfect. Trust that he knows what is best for you and when. So you want, when you want to reset your soul and your relationship with God, you will be the person that you see in that mirror, beloved in his eyes. So here is a question that I'd like you to ponder this morning and in the days to come. Who are you? You will only be the best version of yourself when you want to follow Christ. And we can try our hardest to be the best we can possibly be, but we will only be able to reset our soul and be made right with God, not by what we do, but what we allow God to do through us. Who are you? Who do you want to be? As you search your heart in this new year, what needs a complete transformation in your life? What will it take to reset your soul? Please don't try to do a makeover by yourself. Before you start remodeling or trying to change on your own, call on the carpenter of Galilee, Jesus Christ, to help you. Amen.